Praise the Lord. And I don't know what you expect out of the service today, but I know on the way over here, I had the Lord whisper to me that he was going to bless me. Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope he blesses you, but that's up to you too. <laughs> Praise God. Y'all go ahead and be seated for a little bit. My wife would like to testify. Did you want to sing? I'll sing. Okay. They want to put her on the spot. But I got to live with it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go ahead.
I'm your Pastor John's favorite uncle. <laughs> Don't tell the other uncles though. I thank the Lord for his blessings. Praise God. I want to go ahead and read out of 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18. One thing that I felt this morning, kind of like, not a weight, but not a bad weight, just kind of a heavy feeling, is like, I thought about all of my elders. Brother and Sister Edgar Jones, that my wife and Sister Ratliff came in under her. And Brother, Brother Stroud, that, that passed, that, I don't know if y'all call him Pastor Bishop Ratliff, the elder Ratliff, that, that he came under. They're all gone. And you get get our age, and it's like all of a sudden we're the elders. It's like, whoa, when did that happen? You know, I still remember being ten years old, and I still feel like it sometimes for a short moment, anyway. And, and uh, when I was a little kid, that, that Batman TV y'all go ahead and be seated. That Batman TV show came on for the first time. I think it was on Tuesday and Thursday. That, now I know we ain't supposed to be watching TV, but we did back then. We were like borderline Pentecostal. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we just had we we just had a black and white TV little old thing because we were I didn't know it, but we were kind of poor. <laughs> but uh, my sister, who was already grown, she had a color TV, so we went to her house, or I went to her house. Somehow or another managed it and saw Batman first time. And I'm not talking about that grim, gory jump they got nowadays. I'm talking about da 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 You know, the one, the cartoon at the beginning of it. And I'm 65 years old now, but every time I hear that music, I'm, for a moment, I'm 10 years old. <laughs> Praise God. And a while back, my wife bought me a Captain Action action figure. One of those, you know, the 12-inch dolls. They don't like to use the word doll, especially when you're a kid. But, but uh, the earliest action figure. And he could dress up as all kinds of superheroes. And he was the ultimate. I've actually preached sermons about Captain Action. <laughs> because he was a hero in his own right. But he could dress up as all the other heroes. So when you took the mask off, he's still a hero. But uh, my wife a while back got on eBay, eBay, I guess it was, and found me a Captain Action. So I got one sitting in a, in a, in a glass frame or display in our room. So I know what it's like to be a child, and every now and then I just feel like I want a do-over, you know? And that path untaken. But I've been thinking a lot about my childhood and how, how some people are so important to me. And when you're a kid, you don't think about it. They just are what they are. But when you get older and look back and realize how precious, you just wish you could go back and just hug them again. Just be with them just a little bit longer. And we'll read out of 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 1 verse, verse 18. Now this takes place around the time of the coronation of David. And this chapter in particular mentions the names of David's mighty men. These guys were the ancient version of superheroes. We're talking about guys who slayed giants, monster-like people, and and many, many different people coming up against them. And in the chapter, it names several names and talks about how they had joined David. But I just wanted to read one particular verse here. And it says, Then the Spirit came on Amasai, he was a warrior, but he was also a man who had the spirit on him, who was chief of the captains. And he said, Thine are we, David. Now he's he the, each one of the mighty men are coming before David, who is who is king, and pledging their loyalty. And this is what he's doing, but he's doing it in the spirit. Thine are we. We're, we belong to you. But then the next verse, it says, And on thy side. 
It doesn't matter how many other offspring of Saul comes up out of the woodshed or out of the wood pile. We're on your side, David. It doesn't matter what the Philistines do or what the Midianites do. We're on your side. We put our lot with you. And on thy side, thou son of David, peace, peace be unto thee. And peace be unto thine helpers. For, the, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the man. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for the kindness and the love that we feel in this place, God. We pray that every soul here will be blessed in Jesus' name. Y'all can be seated if you'd like. Amen. For the last several days, and I don't know, maybe it's something that, you know, I just recently turned 65 and maybe this is like a an old person's crisis, you know, like a midlife crisis or something. But I've been thinking a whole lot about my childhood. Now I've been remembering my local church that I grew up in, in my Sunday school. And I really feel in my heart, now I'm prejudiced obviously, but I really feel it was the best Sunday school in the world. The best church in the world. And we had, we had, we would say everything, but all the normal things that a Sunday school would have. We had Sunday school proper. We didn't have videos back then. We had the little felt boards, the little characters. I don't know if they still use them or not. I think they probably should. We had all that. We had children's church sometimes after Sunday school. Keep all the knotheads like me out of, the, out of disrupting the big time service. But those, those were important things. You slap a, if you just said something that was children's, it took on a whole new dimension. And everybody was excited about it, wanting to go to it. Children's choir, we had that. Of course, I was one of those kids that just mouthed and stuff because I didn't want nobody to hear me. And uh, plays, church plays for Christmas and different holidays. Uh, I don't know how y'all do it here, but back in those days, we all started off in the main sanctuary. Then they had what was called a penny mark. Every Sunday school kid on the way to Sunday school would drop in some pennies in a big jar. And that was used at Christmas time to buy a bath, like these bags. And I know that a lot of churches still do it today, but they buy these bags, you get an apple, an orange, nuts, and candy. And that's about it, but, you know, it's a full bag. And when they called off, you know, they made sure everybody got one. But they didn't do like they usually do and let the old people come to the front of the line. They started off with the little kids. And made sure all of us got our bags of fruit and candy. And that, that, you know, that's important stuff to a kid. You might not think it's a big deal, but it is. And it's stuff you remember forever. And those people, they were my Sunday school teachers now. True enough, a lot of them were cousins and things like that. But they were wonderful people. A few months back, I was praying with a young man in our church, and I saw my Sunday school teacher, one of my Sunday school teachers, I saw him superimposed on the other one. Kind of like a, you'd say a ghost, but it wasn't a ghost. What it was was a vision. And God was showing me that this young man, he's still a teenager, but God was going to make him like this man in my past that was so precious to me. And the man, in case you're wondering, is Franklin Carroll. He died at a young age, relatively speaking. One of the first things I, as a young person, as a child, I experienced was the tragedy of his death. Uh, the way I see it, he's just so good God took it, you know. But he was wonderful to me. And I think we need to be wonderful to other people. But, you know, I, I, could, I could spend more time just talking about all the things we did in Sunday school and all the things we did in church. And not, not one particular thing would cause me to say it was the best in the whole world. But one thing 
that as I begin to think about it, what really made it special? What made me so passionate, even today as an old man, so passionate, even about the remembrance of it, was one thing in particular. Is that everybody there was on my side. I was just a, a nodhead, you know, I failed the second grade because I didn't care to learn. I didn't decide that I better start learning something until I was about the sixth grade. But as troublesome and annoying as I was, they were on my side. The world, it seemed, in some respects, the world was against me from the time I was born. But here was a, a family, a church, a Sunday school where everybody was on my side. Praise God. And that's what's important. There were times in my life that, that from my perspective, it would seem that the love and encouragement that they gave me was in vain. Because I was one of them heathens that always was kind of spooked by God. And every now and then I'd go down the altar because I was scared to go to hell. But I always kind of bargained in my mind, you know, God, one day I'll live for you. One day, one day, putting it off, putting it off. And I didn't actually come to the Lord until I was 18 years old and already in the army and was loaded down with responsibility. But I heard my brother and his wife had invited me to church. And I heard the voice of God through the preacher. Not audible voice from heaven, but it was the voice of God nevertheless. And God was saying, does anybody love me? And they had the altar call. And I was already, I was already bargaining in my mind. You know, it's about time for me to cash in my chips, so to speak. It was about time for me to make good what I've been telling God. And my brother looked at me and kind of gave a nod, and that was all it took. I went to the altar. And I was praying at that altar. And everybody, you know, is always, they're, they're hollering different things to you while you're trying to pray. They're trying to encourage you, but, you know, it gets confusing sometimes. Especially stand up, sit down, and all that. But they kept telling me, tell God you love me. I couldn't do that because I knew I couldn't lie to God. But I looked up and I said, God, I don't love you because if I did, I'd be living right. But I want to. And when I said that, Like a hammer fell from heaven and crushed my heart of stone. I didn't get the Holy Ghost. I just cried and felt real good about it. I found myself a church, which was Brother William H. Dean's church in Colleen, because I was at what was then called Fort Hood. I don't even know the name now. But uh, went there, and I faithfully went there. And the guys that I worked with, a lot of them I'd gone through basic training and everything. They knew, they knew me. They knew we were kind of wild. And so they saw a change in me immediately and they were all telling me I'm saved. And I didn't feel like I was saved. And I would go to church and I would pray and it would last about noon on the job and it would be back to right where I was at. They may not have always seen it, but it was in me. You know, I was raging inside I kept going to church, and I kept going to the altar, whether the preacher was boring or not. And I say that because sometimes we had uh, we had three services, at, well, four services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and uh, Tuesday night, and then Thursday was youth night. And youth night, you usually just played a game and said, look, and at the end of it, you let some young person give a little sermon in. And sometimes it was a full-blown sermon, but usually just something a little small, some. Somebody to wet their feet in, you know. And uh, it didn't matter. I went to the altar. And it got to the point where 
I felt like I was embarrassed to go to the altar because I'd been so much. I'm wearing these people out. But I just kept going. Finally, one Sunday, I went to the altar. And there was a few people praying with me, but it was uh, like it was a supernatural thing because I didn't hear the people that was praying with me. All I heard was the people cutting up in the vestibule. And I heard them laughing and carrying on doing all the normal things people do after church, you know, when they're not prayerful. And I heard that. And it made me mad. I tried to pray. And all I could hear is that noise. And them, them carrying on. And uh, I don't have anything against anybody. I don't even remember who it was. Just the noise of it. And a voice spoke to me and said, get up, leave, and never come back. Well, I knew it was the devil. And I ignored that voice. And I came back to the next service. And the next service, you know, Pentecostal people, Doctrine 101, when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues. I went to that service, and the pastor was talking about the, the subtleness of the devil. Now he don't go around sticking his tongue out and watering on the ground like a serpent. And uh, it was a true enough message, but almost in mockery to the message, when I went down the altar, I immediately began to speak in another language. And in my indoctrinated mind, I said, well, I must have the Holy Ghost. I'm speaking in another language or speaking in tongue. But the people that were with me, and one brother in particular, he recognized that wasn't God talking. And he laid his hands on me, and he prayed in Jesus' name. And lightning fell from heaven, so to speak. I don't know what people might have saw. I just know what I felt and experienced. And I went rolling across the floor in one direction. Later on, the brother told me he was thrown against the wall in the other direction. And when I stopped rolling... I was speaking another language, but I wasn't just speaking another language. I was speaking in heavenly tongues. And more than that, I felt the river of life flowing within me. Because Jesus said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I, I really believe that we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. And the only way you're going to know is when the river starts flowing. Praise the Lord. And the only way you're going to know that you're full of the Holy Ghost is when it starts to come out the top. Amen. Praise God. When the cup, you know, I go to the Seth Coast stores and 7-Elevens, whatever's convenient and cheapest, and go to the, get a fountain drink, because them bottle drink, who's going to pay two ninety five for 16 ounces, you know? And you get that, you fill it up, then you don't want to cheat yourself, so you fill it up after the phone died down, and then you fill it up again, and then you, when you put the lid on, it gushes out because you filled it up too much. Well, I knew it was full. Likewise, in the Spirit, don't brag about being full of the Holy Ghost until it starts coming out of you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Later on in my life, I was able to go back to that church that I grew up in. And the pastor graciously had me preach for him. Now, I admit sometimes I've been jealous of other people because they'll get a call on their life and the moment they get up there, it's like, boom, everything happens and they're preaching fire and, and, and it didn't happen with me. I got up to preach because God had called me to preach and, the, and my best success at the beginning was not to faint. And sometimes I'd get so confused, I didn't know what I was saying. And that, that pastor of my youth had me preach as one of them young green preachers, and nobody criticized it. Later on, I was able to preach for him again. And I believe I had some of my first, I, you know, you don't really like to use the word successes with something spiritual. But those sermons where you preach and you know you've been used by the Lord. And, and God worked and, and moved in that service. And I was able to experience that. And I was glad. 
Especially for being there. They could see that their investment in me, at least it paid off So I don't know if they ever thought about it that way. And there were so many people in that church that were important to me. It wasn't just the Sunday school teachers and the pastor. Sometimes it was just the regular folks too. There was a brother there. His name was Brother Dean Robinson. And he had that deep, deep voice. And when he spoke, everybody listened. And he just had that awesome, to me as a boy, you know, you want to be a man, you know, and have that head chest of fur, you know. <laughs> and, uh, they don't do that nowadays, but that's what kids used to dream of. But Brother Dean was that kind of man. He just, and I say Brother Dean, that's his first name, but that's what everybody always called him, but Brother Robinson. He had that voice. I, I believe that he could have probably got up and set a nursery rhyme and we'd still been awestruck because of the quality of his voice. But it was just his manliness as a little boy and, and, go, and most of my childhood, it was like women went to church with their kids and the men didn't. They went fishing. But here he was in church and it was so important to me to have that manly man in church. Praise God. I don't know if anybody thinks of me that way. They probably think of me as the clown. I used to be the class clown. I guess sometimes I still am. Whenever I preached for the pastor there, his name was Brother Ford, he always announced me as Brother Timmy. Because that's what I was in Sunday school. That's what they've known me all my life as. And if I was to go somewhere else and they'd call me Timmy, I'd think they'd make fun of me. But when he said it, it was a term of endearment. It brought smiles in everybody's face. And he called my wife, Sister Timmy, humorously. Because my, my mother was Sister Hillhouse. But actually, sometimes they even called her by her first name because church wasn't just a place where strangers hung out. It was family. And it still is. Should be anyway. And what, what am I really getting at? These people were on my side. This man that I wrote I read about in the scriptures, he was on David's side. If you do anything in your life of any value, be on somebody's side. Be on a young child's side. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know what their home life is like. You don't know where their mom and daddy is. Be on their side. Praise God. Be on the widow's side. Be on the side of the poor and the needy and those who are weak and have whatever need it is. Be on their side. Let them know they're not alone. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And especially be on each other's side. I can say in Jesus' name, on Christ's behalf, be on each other's side. Let each of you know that you have the other's back. That you're not alone. You don't have to struggle by yourself. Right. Don't sit there with an empty plate when somebody's got a bag of beans. Right. Amen. Praise God. Share and give to each other. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us to cast thy bread upon the water. And thou shalt find it after many days. Ecclesiastes 11 and 1. And I always thought that meant money. You know. Give money and you're going to get money. Well it says bread. You know bread is the Bible. So let's carry it up a little more spiritual. Give somebody the word of God, and then what? The word of God comes back to you. You know what it means? It means bread. You take care of the hungry, and when you're hungry, somebody else will take care of you. It ain't always about food. Whatever the need is, if you, if God has empowered you, if God has blessed you, maybe He did it just so you could bless somebody else. Amen. Remember what Mordecai told Esther? How do you know that, that God didn't put you in this place to deliver Israel? But if you don't, God will still deliver Israel, but you and your father's house will be in bad shape. Now that's a paraphrase, but y'all know the story. Praise the Lord. The scripture tells us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you understand that? If it, 
In order for you to give, that means you've already received. You're already blessed. The only way you're going to get anything else or go to any place higher is to bless somebody else. Psalm 118, beginning in verse 1 down to verse 7. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. I got room. I'm not being pressed anymore is what it's saying. In a large place, that gives you room to shout too. The Lord, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. Praise the Lord. Can you just say that with me today? The Lord is on my side. Praise God. I will not fear what can man do unto me. Hey, devil, I ain't scared of you because look who's on my side. Trouble comes and trouble goes, but the Lord is on our side. He said he will not put anything upon you that you're not able to bear, but we will with every temptation make a way of escape already when the trouble comes. God's got your back. God knows you can make it. And there are times in life where you don't think you can make it. And there are times in life that you would not be able to make it except God is on your side. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. You know, one of the things is uh, I was adopted by my grandparents later on when I was about, I think, in the second grade for the second time. And, uh, Somewhere around there. So most of my early uh, friends, they knew me as a different name and knew my situation. My last name was Bird before I got adopted. And so they, a lot of them called me Birdhouse. Yeah. But uh, I was my, because of the adoption, all my legal brothers and sisters were actually my aunts and uncles. So they were all older than me. My biological mother became my sister because I was adopted by her parents. And she had me when she was 15. So there really wasn't that much of a difference in age. But the problem was, I didn't have any big brothers, or even big sisters for that matter, in school. And I always hated the idea that nobody was there to back me up. And there was a bunch of punk kids at school. I don't know, I guess all the kids at school now, they're all just wonderful, right? But there was always some troublemakers in school. And there was some of them I knew I could take them. The only problem is, they had big brothers. And you can't just take out the troublemaker. You've got to take out the rest of them. I just wish that I had somebody backing me up. Now... I'm probably thankful now that I didn't, so I didn't get into trouble, or more trouble. But what's it saying here in verse 7? The Lord taketh my part. The Lord's got my back. Another scripture says, he will have our re-reward, which means he's got our back. Praise the Lord. Nothing's going to happen to you that you're not able to take care of. He knows the end from the beginning. He knew you are going to have the trouble before the trouble came. And he already arranged an escape. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you pray for things and then if the answer to the prayer comes 
And you realize, in order for that answer to have come and arrived in the manner that it did, it had to have been on its way before you ever prayed. Yes, thank you. He knows. Yes. Praise God. This also reminds me that when we get caught up in sin, He's still on our side. He's still hoping for the for us. He tells us to love, hope of all things. How much more so is the God of love? When we fall, He's there to pick us up. He's there to encourage us, to strengthen us, not to cast us out. When it says, the Lord is on my side. He taketh up my... I think about it in a courtroom type of situation. He's our lawyer. The Bible says we have an advocate with the Father. A lawyer that will take care of. He'll plead our cause before the heavenly throne. Praise God, so to speak. And he never loses a case. But you know, the Bible teaches us clearly that God is a spirit. I'm talking about God the Father. Obviously Jesus is a flesh and blood being glorified, but still a body. But God in his entirety, God the Father is a spirit. And it says a spirit hath not flesh and blood. And we know Jesus is not coming back to the earth until he comes back. And it tells us in the Bible to beware of those who said, Jesus is over here, Jesus is over there. And beware of these false prophets you got on, on TV and radio and whatever, the internet, that are telling you that Jesus came and visited with them and told them this and that. They're lying. Amen. Jesus might tell them something, but it ain't physically. He didn't have coffee with them. You know, God being a spirit, though, works through those that are not spirits. The Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will be heirs of righteousness. But yet, in my life, I, I've interacted with angels. And I can tell you some stories that you'd have, I don't want to say you have a hard time believing because I don't know where you're at in the Lord. But it's a pretty spectacular thing. And I'm reasonably certain that I've interacted with angels more than I know. Because the Bible talks about us entertaining angels unaware. And I think that's probably the same for most of us here. That there have been times we've interacted with angels and we didn't know it. I know that in the spirit, sometimes in an altar service, you'll feel like a particular spot is blessed. I was in a church one time. It was in Oklahoma. And it was like, as long as I stood in this one spot, it's like heaven itself was open and all these blessings just pouring down. That's what it felt like. And so much so that I went... And when I stepped out of the spot, I still felt blessed, but it wasn't as intense. And I don't remember who it was, whether it was my wife or somebody else, but I was going to go get them and bring them to the spot so they could feel what I feel. It's like, well, that don't even make sense. God is everywhere. You know, the Holy Ghost fills the house. What's going on there? What was going on there was there was an angel standing there, and when I got beside the angel who had been in the presence of God, I felt the glory of God. Praise the Lord. But what I'm really getting to is that the interaction that we have with angels and, and God using angels to, to be on our side, to take our part, it's relatively a small amount of time. I can't really say it's few and far between, but I want to. I can't say it because I don't know. But it seems to be but the majority of the time when we can say God did this and God did that, He didn't come down in the cloud and do it. He didn't send an angel to do it. He laid it on the heart of some brother or some sister somewhere to meet that need. Praise God. And almost, I say almost because I have to sit down and analyze everything. Almost every time that God has whispered to me, I'm going to bless you and in a non-spiritual kind of way where you had a physical need. It was 
someone that blessed. When we needed food, we didn't ask for food. But God laid it on people's heart and they brought us food. Praise the Lord. There was a brother that I was stationed with in Germany. And uh, it was a time in my life when everything fell apart. And after Germany, I think we saw each other a few times at the church that we both came out of. And then I never saw him. And we were in need. We were living in Brother Stroud's house out on Lake Belton. Pretty nice when you... Uh, you're almost destitute, and yet you're living in a house overlooking the lake. But Brother Stroud gave us his house to live in, and he lived with Brother Ratliff in town so he could be closer to church. I think it was that was their excuse, but it was really about helping us. But when we were there, we were still having a hard time, and in and, and our little world, financial things was going on, and, and everything was collapsing, and knock, knock, knock on the door. And there's this brother that was only really close to me during that time when we were together in Germany. And there he was bringing us a blessing. Just out of the blue, we'd say, no, it was a God thing. And whenever God tries to use you, let him. You don't know the blessedness of giving when it's not your hand, but it's really the hand of God. When you give in Jesus' name, likewise, when you pray in Jesus' name, it's not a spell that we're casting. In Jesus' name means on his behalf, in the stead of Jesus. And think about that. When you give something to someone, whether it's a physical thing, a spiritual thing, when you give in Jesus' name, you're the hand of God. We are the body of Christ. The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in our mortal body. And likewise, as he was quickened from the dead, so shall we be. Amen. Praise God. Let God use you to bless someone else. To meet someone else's need. Don't sit there for a pat on the back. Just quietly do God's will. And I, the scripture that our pastor brother johnson had preached out of a while back and it really hit me because god opened up my eyes to it he's actually had me do the, the scripture reading for him when i read it like boom but that scripture says let not your right hand know what your left hand do or not i said it back let not your left hand know what your right hand do it that's a timeless way of illustrating a point the left side is the logic side. The left represents the mind, the will, the emotion. That's man, the man's mind, the man mind. The right side is the spiritual side. You'll read when John or Peter and John went to, through the gate beautiful, called beautiful, and there was the beggar. It wasn't the left hand that, John, that Peter reached out with. He extended his right hand, the hand that represented the things of the spirit. You say, well, that's kind of a stretch. No, that's a timeless way of illustrating something. Now, if we were put in modern terms, we might say it a little different. But the Bible was written for all ages, not just for now, but for then too. What is it saying? It's saying when the Spirit lays something on you, when the right hand does something, don't let the mind talk you out of it. And how often times have we missed blessings for others, but also... Blessings for ourselves because instead of just following the Spirit, we thought, well, you know, I don't have that much money. Or, well, you know, I don't really know them people. Or, I don't know how they'll react. What's that? That's the mind. That's the left hand. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand does. When the Spirit moves you to do something, just do it. Yes. Praise the Lord. And ask Him for nothing because God sees it all. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, beginning in verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. You know what? God can use even that, though. You know, whoever's doing that for that reason, they don't get a blessing. But you're going to get your blessing one way or the other if God decreed it to be so. 
but they lose their reward. Kind of like the idea, you know, when you put a big offer in, you let everybody know you done lost your reward. Don't let everybody know what you're doing, what you're giving. Just give with a free heart. Let, but let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. And I've, I've thought a lot of times that it amazes me that people will do things for the wrong reason from their perspective. Nevertheless, I'm still blessed. So praise the Lord anyway. But don't lose your blessing. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, with humbleness in other words, let each esteem other better than themselves. You know, Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. He said, you call me Lord, and so I am. Even though don't talk about it, well, I'll, I'll read it later. He's not, it's not, thought it's not robbery to be equal with God. Yet, what is he? He's a servant. He came to serve. Who are you? I don't like these people that stand up in their throne on, or in, you know, on the platform or sitting in their throne and expecting all the other minions to bow before them. That ain't God. We call our leaders ministers. What is a minister? A minister is a nice way of saying servant. But they minister, they serve whatever the, you know, whatever their calling is, what the need is. But let each esteem the other better than themselves. Why? Well, ain't nobody better than me. Better watch out. You're probably far lower on the run, on the run than you think you are. But you ought to think that the weakest, the newest, if it, you know, if that applies, but the weakest member should be esteemed as the greatest. Praise the Lord. And love each other completely and wholly. Look not every man on his own things. You know, I've had preachers that I thought were my friends. And they tried to rope me into multi-level marketing. The only one that gets rich in those schemes is the guy who starts it, or the people that get in on the ground floor. And I'm not really, well, I am criticizing it, but I'm not trying to be too hard on it because I know people do different things to try to make a buck. But when you don't see somebody for a long time and they call you out of the blue and you get excited because well, they thought about you, and then when you get together, they try to hook you in with Amway or something, something else, stream energy, then and it hurts your heart. Like that's all you wanted. I thought you loved me. Look not every man on his own things. Don't be trying to make a buck. Don't go to church so you can sell somebody something. Now, I'm not talking about fundraisers. I can use some peanut brittle right now. Probably not really, but would like so. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Now wouldn't it be a wonderful church, or a wonderful church world, not just that's the local assembly, but all the church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody else would just look out after each other? You know, some do. We call them Christians. So what am I saying? Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody that went to church was a Christian? Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God the Bible says the express image of his person in him dwelt the fullness of the God in bodily all the God you're ever going to see is Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. I don't want to show a hand or anything like that, but would you be willing to die for your brother and sister? 
Praise God. I had a reputation, kind of like a tongue-in-cheek type of thing, but, you know, sometimes I have a hard time expressing emotions, and people don't realize all the emotions I have inside. I think that comes with being a man, you know. I can't help that. That's a soft hope for prayer. I heard one time, I'm a man, but I can change, I think. No. I have a hard time expressing emotions, but one time I, I told church, they thought I was joking or making a joke because I'm always doing that. But I said, I'll take a bullet for you. What more do you want? But I really felt it, you know. Somebody's shooting at the church. I'm going after them. I don't care what I got on me. Or I'd rather die myself. I'd rather take the bullet for somebody else. But what about you? You never really know until it happens, I suppose. I was telling Brother Riley, past elder Brother Riley, last Thursday about a dream I had. I had a long time ago, but it was brought back to me. And I'm not saying it was a supernatural dream, although I kind of think it was, but it didn't have that, like, prophetic-type feel to it. It was more like a lesson. And in this dream... I moved back to my childhood home. I had bought it because it had been exchanged through many different hands. My mother sold it to my sister. She sold it to somebody else, and they sold it to somebody else. And finally had an opportunity to buy it, and I bought this home. Now, it was a humble home, a little wood frame house. And so after I bought it, we were going to remodel it. Kind of dumb why I buy it and remodel it, but that's what people do, you know. And uh, so I thought I'd remodel it. And I started to remodel it. And uh, these people showed up, walked in the driveway and looking around. And my, my thought in the dream was like, who are these people? What are they doing on my property? And it was defensive, like, who are you? What do you want type of feeling? Oh, now I was, I had the presence of, mind to not be rude or anything, but that's what I was kind of feeling, that emotional type of turmoil inside. And uh, answered a few questions or whatever. And then the next thing I know, more people showed up. And more people showed up. Only they didn't just show up. They came to help. And as, as more people showed up, and they brought tools and, and lumber and whatever was needed, and they began to work on the house. And there were so many people helping me that all I could do was keep passing out the iced tea and, and uh, being a facilitator, so to speak, and making sure everything and everybody was taken care of. And towards the end of the dream, we had taken the back side of the house where the kitchen would have been, and we had a big rectangular window which was really at that time just a hole cut in the wall. And it, it was like a little bar there with some stools so people could sit down there and look outside. And there were three stools there with three people there. And there was a little child that went up to the one. And he's like, get away from me, kid. And went up to the other, same thing. And they went up to the third person. The third person picked him up and threw him down. Threw him against the corner in the floor. And I knew the kid, the child was hurt because of the violence of the act. And yet the child didn't cry, just sat there or you know, laid in a fetal position and shook. And I immediately ran to the child and began to comfort it. And I realized who that child was. The one that threw him down was his father, but the child was somebody in my past that I could have been better to. They're dead now, but I could have been better to them when I had opportunity. But I was there trying to comfort them and kind of, I was in kind of a shock when I realized who that child was. You know, it's a dream, so it didn't make a whole lot of sense because the person died as an adult, but I could have helped. I could have done more. Would it have done any good? Does it matter? I could have done more. 
But after that, and what had happened is, instead of me trying to do everything on my own, instead of it being me, 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 in my house, when I opened myself up, when I opened the house up, and I realized that I had become a servant to everybody in the house who was doing the rest of the work, then I looked out that window that was made, and the, the view of it was indescribable. It was like an animated scene where the colors were just perfect colors of blue and green and rolling meadows, a little creek with a wooden bridge across it, the sun in the sky smiling down, you know. And it was an overwhelming beauty to it. It was heaven. And I realized when I take my proper role as a servant, then heaven is opened up. But what about you today? Don't worry about yourself to take that role. Put on you the form of a servant as, as the Lord did. Serve one another. Look after one another. Be on each other's side. Be on these children's side. Probably irritated because they didn't have Sunday school today. I hope I'm entertaining them up. But be on each other's side. Have each other's back. Acts 20 and 35. I've already, I've already quoted part of it. But I, have, I have showed you all things. How that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And in closing, one more scripture. If you'd like to stand. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all shall it be measured to you again. And we usually will equate that scripture with money. And for men, money is the hardest thing to let go of sometimes. Most of the time. So that could apply, but I think it means a whole lot more than just money. Give whatever you have that's needed at the moment. <laughs> Give with abandon. Pastor D. Long, who passed away last year, I think it was. was it? I guess it was a year. It might have been longer now. But it's like he has such a deep influence on all of us that it's almost, and Brother Radis agreed with me the other day when I said it, it's like, it's like he hadn't left. Because it's his, his spirit, you know. I'm not saying his ghost a little but the way he was, his mannerisms, they're in us so much that it's like he's still there. But one of the things that used to kind of aggravate me me being carnal, you know. Uh, and wherever we went, he's always giving. You know, that we'll work for food when they're lying about it, they won't work for nothing. But he always gave those guys. I'm like, roll up the window, keep going. Don't look that way. Because I've been hit up so many times. But he would drive over to them, give them a few bucks. He didn't worry about getting ripped off. He didn't worry about whether the person had more money than he did. He just gave. Like I said, me trying to be his defender, I was kind of aggravated about it. But funny thing is, he never ran out of money. He was always taken care of. And now he's enjoying things that we're hoping to enjoy. Praise God. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If you really understood that, if it really is in your heart, then there should be a, a, a feeling of excitement whenever God lays something on you because you know the blessing's coming to you. Praise God.
Pray the bread that you bring in your life to come. And thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would lead us and guide us. Help us not get so caught up in the things of life that we ignore your voice, that still, small voice. Help us to be tender to the things of God, but especially also to be tender to the needs of others and even against, especially those of the household of faith. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Amazing word, you know, we, we need to take that with us, use it. We need to continue to live for the Lord, we need to allow God to be in our lives. And I'd like to close this service, I won't keep y'all too long, I'd like to close in prayer. God, thank you for allowing us to be here, and to, you know, take this word with us, God. Don't allow us not to just go through one end and out the other, but take this, this message that was preached to us, God, and to use it to minister to other people that may not know who you are, God. Um, I pray that um, during our week that, you know, that we will be ministers in our, in our day-in-day lives. In Jesus' name, I pray.